maybe it. Thank you so much, Fadia and Nadia, for organizing today's community call. And thank you for the kind introduction. I am very excited to moderate today's session. I'm also excited to welcome Dan, um, who's going to be our expert. <laughs> I'm more the question giver in this. And I'll be giving you a bit of an intro in just a second, Dan. Allow me just to share with you why I suggested this to be one of the community topics that were addressing in yeah in the series of calls that we have where gig members share topics um and discuss topics of of general interest to the community so um we're in a pathway of exploring how different gig members are working with artificial intelligence and also how we want to let's say position ourselves as a community um to working with this technology in future and we had a wonderful training from Adriano when we had the gig gathering in Berlin, which he's going to repeat for us online. And I'm just thinking about putting a little series of discussions like the one today together. So please see this as part of the series. And the point of inspiration, maybe I can share my screen with you very quickly. I um, I I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook anymore at all, but I do spend time on other social media and learn about this phenomenon of the weird AI Facebook takeover. And then I rabbit hole into this for way too long. So of course we're all familiar with how AI has become um, an image generator, especially now with generative AI, which we'll be speaking about in a minute. And of course, we've also in the past years have discussed the dangers of misinformation and and AI imagery in different contexts. But things seem to explode this year, probably also with the explosion of generative AI generally. And things just got weird at some point. So just sharing with you quickly. Um, I think we're used to images um, like... Yeah, where it's kind of like it's hard to differentiate what is what is fake, what is real. And and that's not where the weirdness came in, really. The weirdness came in more when uh things just take took a a bit of a odd turn. Sorry, I'm trying to maneuver too many tabs here. And all of a sudden we found uh Facebook kind of swamped with images like this. And there are so many different articles addressing this phenomenon of the weird AI Facebook takeover and just a complete what seems like an unstoppable plethora of nonsense images swamping the web and and then of course there's everything in between and it so happened that and there's no shame in this there's uh a lot of these weird AI Jesus imageries but there's also a lot of different tangents all probably created to create clickbait I'm curious to learn your um views on this dan um there's also a lot of this with my own two hands and you see little kids building crazy stuff out of plastic bottles skyscrapers tractors etc and one of these images was shared uh in by a by a community member and that was kind of the point where i thought okay um this is obviously having an effect on our different lives on the way we use our different social media and 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 there seems to be a a lot of weird phenomena going on on the internet that we all live in. And, and there were some touching points with our community. So we thought it would be a good idea to have this kind of educational call today to talk about the power of AI images and um, yeah, and to discuss what that, what that might mean for our future ways how we want to use AI, but also for our navigation through these uh, weird corners of the internet. So uh, that was my little introduction. And with that, I'd like to, like I said, uh, introduce Dan a little bit more, technology consultant and web developer from Rogue Agency, who's been active in the Defy Hate Now project, where he's been overseeing um, the architecture and implementation of technology for peace solutions, fact checking, open data platforms. So the powers that go, <laughs> that work against <laughs> basically us being um, bombarded with this kind of nonsensical stuff. And Dan has done a really important, a lot of important work in this area, um, which is why it's really great to have him here today. And yeah, thanks so much for joining our call today, Dan. 
Thank you so much and thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here and good to see you all. Um, I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, your audio is good. Thank you. Um, maybe, okay. I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about here. Um, maybe you can begin by sharing a little bit the work that you do in general to introduce yourself a bit more and how AI generated images have been impacting the work that you do. Okay. Yes. Um, also, I have some few slides that I had prepared to. Oh, please. If you want to show those first, then please, please go ahead and do that. Yes. And then I'll pop in some questions after. Yes, and I think I'll start off by by introduction. Um, my name is Dan Kingori. Um, share my screen as well. This host, give me the rights. Um, Fadia, maybe you need to enable Dan. I'm not sure if I can. It's Nadia, basically. Nadia? Ah, Nadia, please. Uh, no, sorry, Geraldine, you're the, uh, I think you're the host. Okay, let me just check. Okay, Dan, you, you should be able to do it now. Okay, you can see my screen. Okay, yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, so so as the introduction has gone, um, I work with or for Rogue Agency, uh, mainly supporting in tech development. Um, I've been involved in the Defy Now project for I think three or four years now, uh, starting in South Sudan to Cameroon to Ethiopia right now. Um, and Defy Now project works, you know, in the context of disinformation and combating. Um, online hate speech and online incitement to violence and how that translates to you know the offline uh, actions that happen in the different societies um, including now what we have seen as the new challenge of fake news and uh, topping on that is AI generated images um, I think I will run through the slides quite fast and we can have the discussion um, I'll give, uh, uh, rather we will explore the prevalence of these AI generated images and the implications. Um, we'll figure out how to how to identify them for now in quotes, because it seems like a game of, um, you know, cat and mouse or virus and antivirus. Um, and you see how, how that is playing out. Um, but of course, we'll discuss ways to build resilience within our communities. Um, and, and the basics, which I know most of us might, might have on um, the current situation is it's possible to key in a couple of texts. Um, that text goes through complex algorithms. Uh, I tried to place some simple illustrations of, for instance, uh, generative adversarial networks and how that goes about and you end up with an image or a stable diffusion and how you move from noise to uh, to a real image. And of course, that is democratized. It's, it's, it's not um, a prerequisite now that you have a computer science or data analysis degree to 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 end up with this image with platforms like Dali, Media Negroc, uh, Flux, like many platforms in the hundreds, um, you're able to achieve this from text to 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 an image, and of course that moves into you know very different use cases, uh, cases like uh, okay my 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 fan. Is, is 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 the pope um uh, but also cases like uh, you know telecommunication companies using this for 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 advertisement not just telecommunications but uh, mainstream mainstream corporates using this these these technologies for the uh, for their advertisements and strategic communications um in Kenya we have a giant telecommunication company known as Safaricom and Sometime 
late last year they put up billboards that 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 had AI characters and AI characters that you could see. You know, you could just look at it and you're like, eh, that's 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 weird. And I I spent some moments to talk with you know friends and just hear their feedback on the same. And I think what kept coming along was you know, there, there is something like this, the lack of emotions, there's a lack of um, the, the, the human touch. Uh, I don't know how they mean by that, but there seems to be that frequent mention of, 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 of something lacking. But, you know, the fact is these technologies keeps, keeps on improving and now it seems almost impossible to, to, to differentiate what is AI generated and what is, what is real. Um, for instance, you have a you know platform like Grok, which at the moment is able to enable you know users to even generate copyrighted characters. Uh, you know, which which brings in a new di uh, dimension into the conversation of um, the society issues that we are facing right now, be it democracy, governance, and 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 how that you know plays around with this kind of generative images and generative technologies. But yeah, um, headlines keep so, keeps on coming in. This was last year and uh, I think uh, it had some, uh, some storm in the internet with, uh, with you know, the current situation in the US and uh, having such images, images surface. Um, but on, not just in the, in the US, um, in different contexts, you'll find, uh, for instance, for instance, right now in Ethiopia, where we have a fact-checking platform, uh, you have a lot of diaspora influence into what, you know, the kind of conversations that are happening at, and and you'll find um, AI-generated images that you know are coming from people who have access to these cutting-edge technologies and have time to fine-tune it and you know get the right prompt that would depict um, a certain um, issue happening, you know, back at home in Ethiopia, for instance. And, and the platform we are running right now, known as Multi Fact Check, um, is of course playing catch up, like, you know, trying to see how, 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 how to debunk and how to sensitize um, whatever, trying to sensitize the online population of um, these images could be fake or could be generated from AI. So please be aware. And I think uh, the biggest issue comes in when some of these images land into, you know, the lowly trust, lowly trade populations and populations who might not have the sophisticated know-how of debunking or, um, or fact-checking for that matter. Yes, um, DRI, who is uh, Democracy uh, Reporting International, uh, set out a couple of approaches in identifying these images. Um, uh, there is a field guide that is publicly available on their website, um, Synthetic Media Exposed, uh, and, and we look uh, briefly into that. So, you know, looking from the basics of it, um, there are a couple of ways to approach, you know, could be could be issues of watermarks and how to identify these images from, from that perspective. You know, some platforms enforce certain watermarks once you generate an image from those platforms. Um, you have certain scenarios of, uh, you know, what is called hyper hyperrealism, you know, two perfect characters. Um, of course, you might also have uh, cases of inconsistent, maybe body parts or body proportions, uh, issues of like broad um, um, uh, parts of the image or disproportionate text, um, or even the image, you know, not being as it's supposed to be, uh, having errors that are conspicuous. But this has to stem from a point of asking one's, oneself a question of, uh, is this is this real? Um, you know, and of course that comes from being at a certain level as we are going to discuss uh, moving forward. Um, I think to add on to this, there are a couple of techniques that 
uh, one can use. Of course, um, the quick one would be a reverse image search. You know, uh, the moment you first see the image, most likely it's been uh, fact checked or it's been uh, talked about on the internet. So, you know, going about and looking at what are other people saying about the same image, I think that is proving to be a very powerful tool or technique um, to, you know, to quickly verifying images. Of course, metadata analysis um, and, you know, making use of platforms and, 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 and uh, websites that uh, their day-to-day -day job is fact-checking. Um, as I already said, at the moment, we have an active fact-checking platform in Cameroon, uh, as well as in, 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 in Ethiopia under Defied Now initiatives, as well as in, in South Sudan. Um, and particularly in South Sudan, um, it started with when the COVID-19 was, um, was at the, at the very peak and that misinformation based on imagery was was at the very epitome and, and the need for society to have a datum or a place where you can you can ask experts or the experts can quickly communicate you know this this information was 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 quite high um was the technicals of metadata analysis uh, but as I said this is a game of catch up, you might find some moments ago, uh, some of these AI generated images had, you know, some predictable metadata, but as time goes by, you'll find that becoming much more sophisticated. Uh, but this could be a good way of, of looking at an image in depth, but maybe also and this might be useful to someone who has the skill set to do a metadata analysis of, of an image. Um, as I already said, reverse image search seems to be to be to be a quick way out, especially for communities who not necessarily need to have technical skills to do to do fact checking. Um, there are a couple of platforms. Um, if time allows us, we can look at some of these platforms. Some of them I found quite um, quite useful uh, AI based detection of of, of uh, AI generated content um, and some of them are quite available to to people um, at less cost uh, less cost inputs um, or freely available for that matter um, but I think the big question at the moment is, not whether when we choose to scrutinize an image, um, we'll find the truth or not, but rather when and why um, should we scrutinize these images? Uh, so that comes from the position of what kind of mindset uh, are we coming from or is, is the current state of our communities? So uh, trying to you know build resilience in that dimension uh, seems to be a good way out, um, you know, think before you click or think before you share, being skeptical of the very content that you're looking at and trying to look back and, you know, verifying the source of it. Um, intentionally building, you know, media and information literacy among our communities. Um, that is seeming to be, I think, uh, a sustainable way of uh, building resilience. And of course, we who are privileged to have this literacy being vocal about this information. So for instance, in our local settings, in our WhatsApp groups, and you find these you know, images being shared widely, being vocal to say that, hey, these, in, these images um, AI generated, these images manipulated, uh, I think goes a long way in uh, building resilience in our communities. Yes, and that's, I think the end of, these slides. Um, as always, most of the time you might find what you're looking at has, has a bigger story to it. So maybe stepping back and saying, wait a minute, um, what is the agenda behind this what I'm looking at? Yeah, but let me end it at this um, and, and maybe uh, take it back to you, Geraldine. And Thank you have... so much, Dan. That was very uh, comprehensive and insightful. So thanks very much. I don't want to monopolize time. So 
Um, I definitely have some questions, but I also want to open it up and see if anybody else wants to follow up with a question to your call before I do. Feel free to use the chat if you're um if you can't use the audio so well. So floor's open. Please feel free to speak, comment, ask questions anytime. Um, but I will <laughs> if nobody else jumps to it first. Um What's in your expert community working on this? This, this is maybe not the easiest questions to start with, but it seems like from the techniques that you showed um, of how to spot AI images, many, two out of six uh, or four out of six will be uh, no longer applicable in the near future as the technology advances, like looking out for the glitches, things that don't add up. So this sort of arms race of having some form of recognizability or control for AI images whilst the technology is developing so rapidly. How are people in the fact-checking community looking at that issue? Um, kindly please uh, run the question again. I got sure. an internet interruption. I'm, I'm, this is a question that nobody, I'm sure, has any like you know real answers to in the sense. But given the technological speed at which things are advancing, um, and the tools that you have to actually fact check and verify, what is the fact checking community? what's what's your take or what are you discussing in terms of this sort of arms race you know the fact that technology is developing so quickly and many of the tools that we have to check if it's an ai image or not may be outdated so quickly so how to deal with that thank you um for instance in cameroon uh, early on in the project we realized um, we have to build resilience to the to the communities and how we build that is um, you know starting out with the multipliers the people who you know are the first to break the news the people who have voice in the society uh, making sure that these people have the fundamentals of um, figuring out this could be fake and you know having the actual mental um, mental uh, awareness that their role in the society is quite critical and they have to look back and intentionally um, fact check. So we've been running a fact checking fellowship uh, that now has gotten to cohort 10, I think trained on over 200 um, uh, fellows over time in the last uh, two years. And the, you know, the conversations that have been happening within those you know, fact-checking circles, because these people come from media houses, they are activists, they are community leaders, they are people who, whatever they see or whatever they see in their communities, most likely has has an impact or has an effect. Has an effect. Um, we see that, um, you know, building a strong sense of, um, a, a strong sense of, uh, wait a minute, um, we need to verify this, like, the gullibility of the communities that they represent or they speak to uh, seems to be, you know, going away, and more resilience seems to be to be coming up as a result of the active action. Um, I think, I think, the success of that um, can only be seen over time, as as you have more multipliers coming in and more people, uh, you know, being able to to fact check and to keep up with for instance, these technologies and to actively, you know, use them for the society good um, is, is built over time. And, you know, now as we race with the catch up from, you know, new technologies providing us, you know, new ways of disseminating information or creating information and trying to catch up with that because bad actors getting hold of that, of course, might have an added advantage. Um, so uh, I think building resilience and building it from the community level seems to be 
um, the co the core conversation that needs to happen on this issue of uh, catching up with AI generated content or or fake news for that for that matter. Thank you, Dan. I would be also super interested from uh, everybody in the call how how and what for you're currently using perhaps AI generated images yourself or if you've ever also been in situations where you felt you needed to fact check uh, images being presented to you. Fadi, did you want to share? Yes, um, I was actually just thinking about this. First of all, thank you so much for such a great discussion. And then it's very nice to get your point of view, having been working on this on the field. Uh, I, I just want to say that just recently I attended this training actually with, by, with a gig member, Rosanna, uh, and it was the first time that I was surprised on how you could use these um, fake generated AI images in a very nice way. So basically it was a training for teachers um, and then uh, Rosanna used uh, uh, the AI to basically create uh, images that very much uh shows different characters and imaginary characters and uh are used in a very storytelling kind of way and i thought wow these are really good it's almost that you can animate or tell story yourself uh probably by just writing a prompt so i i'm just I wanted to share this because it was i had a very negative um point of view and i still share all the fears um that every that dan is sharing here and you geraldine and i still think it's something that we need um, to think about but also i'm trying to think if whether also putting this technology in its own place where it's supposed to be used and how it's supposed to be used, if that would be empowering. Uh, so instead of uh, uh, having it just all over the place being used for whatever uh, reason that is um, also trying to reframe it differently and, and make use of it in uh, our world today, if, if that's something that anyone shares feelings, ideas about and yeah. So not a question, just wanted to share this change of view that happened actually this week. Thank you. How did I miss this training? That sounds like a really wonderful uh, example. Thanks for sharing that, Fadia. Um, I think part of the discussion or some of the things we're thinking of uh, also how do we want to work with this technology and how do we want to perhaps also advise how to use this technology and I think the whole of society is kind of asking itself this question, like how do we not limit the uses of this potentially very impactful technology whilst at the same time steering away from like the downfall of humanity, basically. So I'm I'm haunted by this, not haunted in a bad way. It just kind of like lives in my brain now, this tweet uh, that I read a couple of weeks ago from a artist who just wrote like, why am I still doing my dishes whilst AI gets to do my art? And I think it just brings it all together really, you know, because we want these technologies to be working for us. And at the moment we have so many, um, unlevel playing fields in so many ways that people are disadvantaged and left out of basic connectivity, use of digital technology, let alone use of AI, whilst it's whilst this technology is taking up so much space and especially so much creative space that we feel should be, or many of us are feeling should be left for people and technology should more have a serving character. Um, so there's, you know, a whole nother conversation connected to AI imagery around what of this do we really want? And you mentioned Grok earlier, Dan, we have all these um, companies, all these startups, all these tools coming up, and some of them definitely either have questionable um, finances and, and bosses behind them, like Elon Musk, or questionable business cases. Like I saw one startup really being hyped and getting so much funding. And its use case was that it can write a story around any stock image. So you have like a stock image of that guy with a coffee cup that everybody's, you know, some meme image, and it will write a story around it. And I thought, oh my goodness, how awful, <laughs> you know, like, why does the world need this, you know? And why haven't we not figured out ways to perhaps connect better with each other for those of us who can deal better with text, those of us who can write better rather than 
sort of coming back to acknowledge technology to use it. Sorry, this was a longish intervention now. But um, just, just to get back to the question, I think these are all thoughts that are kind of roaming around the room also within gig. Um, so for instance, I think we would never want a policy that says not to work with AI imagery, but to perhaps have a very critical view on when we create AI images rather than commissioning an artist from the community, for instance. Um, so wondering how this also resonates to some of the conversations maybe you're having, maybe Saad, is there something you want to share how you're working with this kind of stuff or also would be uh, uh, curious to hear your thoughts on that, Dan? Um, just to I'll jump in here a little bit. Um, I really like what Dan shared earlier and you mentioned resilience a lot. Um, my context is uh, based in Singapore and um, a lot of people, a lot of uh, senior citizens are falling victim to scams. And this is a problem that um, uh, has a number to it. It was $680 million that was lost uh, through legitimate transfers, all uh, attributed to scams just in the last year alone. And uh, resilience in the face of the change of technology, I think is uh, much needed. Um, and I don't know if there is like what Geraldine said, I don't know if there is an answer to this, uh, but how do we go about reaching the people who are most vulnerable? I mean, we're talking about people who are um, hidden behind screens and are falling victim to uh, misinformation that is also being delivered on this screen. And we're trying to change their minds or trying to educate and trying to build resilience also through the screen. Um, it doesn't seem like the right approach. Um, so how might we change that dynamic? It, invite people to participate, I, I guess, in a physical way. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily um, in heading in the right direction. Um, so that's just sort of a, a thought I had in, in mind. But um, I, I do have a positive example of, of generative AI that I wanted to share. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but um, I attended a workshop um, at uh, an event called Republica. Can I share a screen? <laughs> All right, here we go. So this image is uh, of a workshop. I forget this person's name. I don't know, Fadia, if you know the person who is conducting the workshop. Um, right now, I can't recall it. I knew it very well. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the session was in German, but um, I picked up enough to be able to understand what he was trying to say. And the idea here was to use generative AI to suggest um, clothes that you could design based on clothes that you found uh, that were either thrown away or uh, bought from a thrift store. So you take a lot of pictures of whatever clothes that you have, and then you upload those pictures to generative AI, and it would suggest um, a design for a shirt or a jacket that you could make out of it. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Um, and it, 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 sort of drives home the point that, look, if you have people who think critically about these kinds of technologies, you definitely will have creative ways of, of using it. Um, so I just wanted to share this as an example. If if I can add something, yeah, please. And I think this really depicts, uh, like really uh, brings uh, my earlier point very well. I think it's the framing of these technology or the lack of framing nonetheless is might have been the problem. The fact that it was open for the public, like uh, GPT-4 technology, I don't know how you say it. And it was opened all of the sudden and, um, and everyone was just like amazed by the abilities of that technology, but it came without a manual normally in, you know, in the past, you'd get a machine, you'd read the manual, you'd know the dangers, you'd know the risks, you'd know how to fix it, you know what you need to. Uh, but there is some some kind of fascination that comes with these kind of technologies that sometimes is uh, is exaggerated, but also taken out of context. So I wonder if, you know, these technologies were uh, introduced as a way to enhance our creative abilities to make us 
think uh, in ways to tell stories, you know, it, if it was a tool for telling stories like filmmakers would do or animators would do, if this would have uh, maybe perhaps made it less threatening um, and put it in a different context. Again, just questions that I think about before <laughs> I go to bed <laughs> at night nowadays. So I don't have answers. I'm, I'm just wondering um, how did we get here so fast? Um, so, so uh, yesterday when I was watching the news, um, a makerspace in Kenya was featured that is using um, VR to train um, people on how to do big welding. And I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, uh, but also uh, in Ethiopia, we ran a project known as Safe Spaces. So trying to, uh, you know, reach out to women communities in the outskirts of, you know, the urban centers and to take them media information literacy classes, uh, cyber security, uh, you know, um, GBV and gender disinformation and such kind of things. Um, and so when you talk of AI with these sets of groups, um, it appears to be this monster thing that is, um, that is the thing actually, you know, someone might refer to AI as the thing, uh, but, but we, we realize the best thing to approach these conversations is to maybe make it boil down to, to, to whatever use cases they have. So in this case, we figure out they have so many questions on, on media and information literacy. So we've been building a, a Telegram chatbot. So Telegram is quite um, quite heavily used in Ethiopia. So we built a Telegram chatbot that is able to handle um, quite a diverse range of media information literacy questions, like the free, frequently asked questions. At the back end, of course, there is an error model that is that is running, but that's not what we we sell what we tell them is you can ask this bot a very simple question a question that you'd have come to me and ask me hey dan how do i um or how do i enable to fa or how do i how do i do this or that on my instagram account or something of that nature a question that the bot will easily answer you and give you quick links for you to for you to just tap on and, and fix whatever uh, for whatever, whatever issue you're having. So I realized that, that some of these technologies um, are sold in, in quite unique packages and especially for communities who are non-tech communities who are just trying to catch up, um, uh, speaking from you know, the word Google South, which I don't like to use, uh, you would find um, some people shunning away or becoming... Um, uh, you know, falling complete to these technologies and not knowing that, hey, it's this technology that's being used to manipulate you. So um, the technologies are there, I think, and we as community leaders, it's up to us to make them available to our communities and make them available in a way that relates to them uh, and, you know, meets, meets their needs. Um, and you know they can resonate with it, and they can make good use of it. Yeah, my two cents. Well, I have one interesting topic here. I'm on transit, so probably my voice will be a bit strange. I will even stop the car. Uh, I think it's quite interesting how we keep how we as humanity. <laughs> We keep getting satisfied, enchanted, absorbed by new brands or new ideas or new development of old things. But at the same time, we can't realize how all those technological gadgets, in theory, they are still the same. So it's been for a while now, maybe around 100 years, that technolo technological development is trying to sell us the magnificent of a better world where computers will work for us, uh, where we will have uh, energy forever and free energy for all. 
and that we will have free, uh, food available uh, for everyone as easy as it looks like in the supermarket. So uh, this idea of the AI and how crazy we go into this thing, it's so similar to uh, Flash Gordon's whatever, or 2001 whatever, or and even some tools that we already had some years ago, like the orthographic corrector some years ago, or any other tools, Microsoft Business Intelligence 10 years ago was like, well, it will change our lives. If you get Watson like 15 years ago, Watson from IBM. So I think it's interesting in a philosophical point of view how humanity is easily mm, cheated by new brands and new gadgets. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to unpack here on a on a philosophical level. Um, and and I think it's a very important point you're making, Ricardo. Like we often speak, and I think you used also the term earlier, Dan, the you know, democratization of technology in terms of accessibility. And um and on the one hand, of course, great that o open AI or Gemini or whatever is publicly available, but but none of us were involved in the discussion at what costs right at what cost of training diet data of of artists and authors and other people's data being used to bring us these tools but also at the cost of follow up like in europe now we have this e ai directive that looks at ai on a risk based level and so there are some ai for instance connected to military or health operations at high risk and then they need to be um um looked at individually before you can go ahead and build it because you know not everybody can go ahead and build everything but of course this is in an area where the long haul risks are not very quantifiable and and things fall in a low risk category because what harm has it done if one more artist becomes unemployed or one more you know one more fake image is generated things that we've all become so used to already you know um but the the sort of more longer term risks on humanity, uh, of course, yeah, like I said, are not accounted for in this. And uh, so I don't want to get too philosophical either. We're running out of time a little bit, but I think I think community is such an important topic within this. Also, when it comes to um, Yeah, sorry, too many thoughts at one time. The question of like how we want to sort of prepare ourselves for things to come. So um, you mentioned also a lot of like current developments, Dan, just like yesterday or two days ago, Trump uh, posted an image of Taylor Swift saying vote for Trump. And 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 that's you know that's just a, obviously a dumb thing to do because there's such a huge community behind you know one pop star and so much money that can like come back but how do we sort of create um yeah create trust and safety not just through technology but also through community and what role can that perhaps play in in this topic area as well Um, that's a loaded question or deflection. Um, so uh, we've had on and off discussions with um, with my clique and with my maybe tech mates, and 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 some of the discussions we've had is um, like what is the role of provenance and algorithms that 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 you know um, that run for instance social media vis with these um, AI generated AI generators um, in terms of in terms of um, not shifting the blame to us as as we the consumers um, what is the effect of me being told by uh, by Twitter or the having a notification that the image you're looking at is AI generated and uh, and enforcing that policy wise that um, um, some of these um, uh, models, and as you've said, um, 
uh, they are so giant and the data set that they have been used and um, the use cases that they are evolving to are are integral with our you know society um with society issue for instance right now in us and the issue of elections coming about and that democratic process happening so this tech if at all it's able to mingle with this um with these processes uh, without proper checks and without you know proper um ethical considerations then uh, we keep on shifting the blame to us and saying that oh, we the people uh, are falling culprit or maybe we need to do much better to catch up with this but rather i think that conversation needs to start from the top on algorithms and you know putting proper measures i like what discussions in the eu are happening on issues of ai um, and how i hope you know come speaking from kenya how i hope this 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 matures soonest enough like this discussion and this uh, this bubble matures soonest enough so that so that we have proper industry standards uh, of 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 content moderation for instance of ai generation generated content and how that is handled uh, for instance on social media um yeah I think it's becoming much more much more complex. It's becoming um, challenging, especially um, looking into looking into the various disruptions that are happening. Uh, I think one of the images that um, I shared that was from South Sudan when South um, MTN South Sudan used an air generated image. I looked at the comments that the communities who are posting on, on their Facebook page or rather on that post. And the comment of, uh, you know, the, the creative outcry seemed to be very loud. You know, the creative outcry of, then what is the position of, of creativity in this? Like there were models who initially used to model for, for MTN South Sudan. There were uh, all these graphic designers, like what is that kind of conversation um, then going going to happen. The same case happened in Kenya when uh, Safaricom and these big uh, corporations used um, AI generated um, content, and they faced a huge backlash. And I think the backlash came from that. Like as a society, this is this is this is this is our norm. Um, maybe this is a huge disruption, but then there needs to be a systematized way of disrupting us, <laughs> not just shocking us all of a sudden and saying. Uh, we are going to install billboards everywhere that are AI generated. Yeah, so I see Wadi and Ricardo's hands are up. I, I just have a very quick note because uh, as it, as you were speaking, I kind of zoned out um, to maybe before AI images, and it's interesting enough because I actually worked on Defy Hate now seven years ago. <laughs> I worked on on uh, on uh, the project when it was just running in South Sudan and northern Uganda and working on Cree. And at the time, there was no AI, generative AI fake images, but there was a lot of fake news. Uh, and it was all about bringing awareness and how it was terrible because you could see how uh, fake news could just directly lead to violent conflicts. So this very not materialistic thing, very intangible thing could lead to very tangible and dire um, consequences. And I remember from the experience I've had with Defy Hate Now, the, the whole thing came down to how can you make people, how can you change people's behavior? It was a behavioral change kind of question at the end, because as humans, we all share traits, no matter how educated, less educated, how um, old, young, maybe it, it differs. You know, it's relative sometimes from, from different group ages or different locations, but there are certain things that bring this all together. Um, and I just wanted to share this because I, I was thinking now that it might be much harder challenge for, for us with this, with the new technologies, but the question remains the same. How do you 
uh, incentivize people to look critically at these technologies. And if it's today AI, yesterday was fake news, tomorrow is going to be something uh, different. Uh, and I just wanted maybe at some point to hear your input on this because you you've been working for the longest on that topic uh, with the Fi Hate Now and if that changed in any ways and yeah. Okay, briefly from my side, uh, when you said about uh, to have the fact check inside the algorithms, inside the social media channels, uh, uh, I think it's much more easy and possible to have the check things as plugins in browsers. I remember some years ago, we had the plugin for fact check in Mozilla that would show up when something would be probably fake news. And this is something we can, probably there's something around happening already in this sense. Uh, and the other topic, it's around all this chat GPT written text that we have now all around, you know, just like Fajr said, everyone is using. Uh, I think it's so notable when you get one of those texts that in the future, we, as humanity, we are going to a place where we humans will write less and less, and that's a moment we will just exchange the small messages, just like medieval times, you know, so we can understand that, whoa, well, this message was written by a human being because it's just four phrases and it's wrongly written, you know, and this kind of thing. So uh, perhaps this is the future for writing with chat GPT. You know? Thank you, Ricardo uh, and Fadia. Um, very easy questions today, Dan. You know, very simple, small questions for you. <laughs> Please, sorry, yeah. back over to you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I think we need to appreciate. Um, getting back to you, Fadia. I think we need to appreciate the times that we are living in right now. Um, as a society, we need to, you know, look at the fundamentals of um, of how we pass knowledge. For instance. Uh, issues of media information literacy needs to be at the core of, you know, elementary learning, you know, learning curriculums. Um, I think here in Kenya, there is a new curriculum that is being introduced um, that is known as competence-based learning. Uh, but up to its introduction, um, computer classes seemed to be introduced very, very late at, at um at a teenager's life, uh, once this teenager has already interacted with with media, and so I think as a society we need to appreciate this. These are the times we are living in. It's bound to become uh, much more in technologically integrated. Um, so, so, so looking at our building blocks, for instance, the education system, um, and trying to strengthen that to accommodate this right from the early age, I think might might be might be a good hack around it but also i think actively reaching out to to communities um, and, and 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 driving the conversation in an active sense um, saying that hey uh, this misinformation problem or this information problem is affecting us actively if 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 it hits us hard we might go into war so we need to take a step back and you know make ourselves media media literate so embrace those community driven um, uh, media literacy engagements uh, in whichever form they come they come with um, i think that that might be a possible way out um uh, i think ricardo you mentioned something and i remember there is a platform known as invid uh, invid is is a browser is a browser plugin uh, that seems to be a one stop uh, a one stop what a one stop um, um, analysis or verification verification platform i think let me share my screen very quickly uh, it's an old it's an old tool it might be the one that you're referring to this one it's known as invid um, it's a browser extension um, is able to look into video, look into images, um, and for instance, images, you're able to look into image analysis, 
uh, to look into metadata, uh, OCR, which is optical character recognition and such kind of things, forensics. Um, so these, these are very powerful tools, I think, but uh, you might find like, for instance, this one has certain, you know, um, elements to it that require certain level of media information literacy and might be maybe suitable for a fact checker or someone who is handling media at a different level. But for a common common user, uh, I think, um, yeah, such such solutions might be useful or, or, or such um, agile verification platforms might be very useful. Um, I think if, 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 um, if, if, I don't know if you can be able to see this, uh, these are some of the platforms that I was tinkering around uh, that would help one identify um, an air generated image. Some of them are open for use. Uh, for instance, um, this Illuminat Illuminatri has a funny name, um, but others need um, have access control or need someone to pay something to access. Uh, but some are uh, very quick and useful, uh, like this fake image detector. Um, some are also quite quite agile, like this photo forensics, and it's open open source and quite uh, quite handy in giving metadata information. Uh, but I think a reverse image search seems to be a quick solution or rather a powerful solution to. Uh, to this this issue of image uh, and misinformation from image from imagery uh, because most of the time uh, a quick reverse image search might show you um, what other people have said about it and might save you a lot of time in doing technical work. Thank you. That was super a great practical note to end on. I would like to suggest. Um, Fadi and Nadia, that we start compiling these tools in just a list, basically, and we can think about what a good place uh, is for people within the gig community to access them. Maybe we'll make a Notion page with all the different um, AI tools being shared across the different trainings and, and community conversation series that we'll be hosting. So that would be fantastic. Um, I think we've reached the end of the time frame for today's session, but I think it was so fantastic, Dan, to learn from your experience here and um, to listen to your insights. And also thanks uh, for everyone else who shared. Um, thank you, Saad and Fadia for sharing um, use cases and tools and Ricardo for sharing some philosophical thoughts. I think there's so much to talk about here. So I'm really looking forward to the next upcoming discussions as well. Um, and if you have ideas or suggestions for focal topics that you would like to have addressed within this conversation series on AI, then please don't hesitate to write to anyone from the gig team who's here, especially though Fadia and Nadia with your suggestions. And yeah, very much looking forward to discussing this topic further. So let's uh, say thank you very much, Dan. Really great to have you here. And I think Fadia has just dropped out. Otherwise, I would have passed back to her. Nadia, did I forget anything? Confessing to you. No, that was all good. Thank you so much, Razin. And thank you so much, Dan. Thank you again to you for organizing. And thanks for everybody for coming. Looking forward to your session soon as well, Adriano. And yeah, everybody have a great day. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye-bye.